a member of the National Reseller Advisory Board for Apple and was appointed as the chairman of this board in January 2012. Bain has worked in the wireless and consumer technology industries for the past 20 years, including four years at T-Mobile USA, where he served at, as the channel director of national retail field sales, managing over 6,000 national retail and prepaid locations across the country. Prior to T-Mobile, Bain worked as the director of business development and vice president of retail sales at ePhones, a wireless product company. Mr. Bain began his, began his career in the wireless phone industry in 1992. Through employment with Cellular One and later was the president and co-founder of Utah Cellular and Communications, the first chain of Cellular One AT&T wireless retail dealer locations in Salt Lake Market. Steve Bain. Okay, so um, who, uh, who has started a business before? Who's interested in starting a business? What, what, do you think the, what do you think the top reason for people that want to start their own business is? Money? Okay. Freedom? Be your own boss. Start a problem Solve a problem? Start a problem, solve a problem, it's all the same. I'll tell you, the, uh, the number one reason that I started Cellular, or Simply Mac is my fourth startup um, that I started. Uh, when I first started, the first company I started with, I felt like there was a need that I wanted to fill and did that. The second startup is I, I was tired of making this wage and I wanted to make what I thought was this wage. What actually happened was I made about this wage, but when I factored in all of the time, effort, and energy I spent on that, I was really making about this wage. <laughs> so um, the last two startups um, have been primarily for um, control of my time and, uh, and wanted to kind of drive my own drive my destiny. So I think um, there's a perception out there that entrepreneurs make a ton of money, uh, and some do, absolutely. Uh, you will work and you will make less money than if you went to work for someone else in the long term in most cases. Would those who have had startups agree with me there? In, yeah, in general, in general. Um, and, uh, but I love, I absolutely love to start companies. So there's, there's, some, there's a couple of things that motivate me um, uh, and a couple of things that just really drive me to do things that are just maybe just out of the ordinary. One is when somebody tells me that I can't do something. And the other one is when somebody tells me that it's never been done. So um, when we started Simply Mac, I had probably, oh, 10 or 15 people say, you can't do that. That doesn't exist. Apple doesn't have a chain of independent dealer-owned reseller stores. You, you, can't, you can't do that. First, first of all, the market doesn't exist. And so first of all, that was my first ticker. I thought, okay, that's the first challenge. Um, and then it's, you know, it's never been done and it can't be done. So um, if, you're, if, you have the, uh, if you have the courage and if you have the desire and the passion to start your own business, do it. It's the greatest thing in the world. It will teach you more about yourself and about others than any other experience that you'll have. And it's a lot of work, but you're gonna work a lot anyway. If you're really successful, you're gonna go spend 60 hours a week anyway I go do something that you love and that's something that you're passionate about and something that inspires you to, to do, you know, to do great things. Um, and, uh, and so I think I, I'll start with that. My hope is in the next, I'd like to spend about 35 minutes and talk about three things. I'd like to talk about what it means to be an entrepreneur. I'd like to talk a little bit about Simply Mac uh, and kind of give you a flavor of our business so you understand kind of what we do and how we've been able to do it and some of the challenges that we've been able to overcome. And the third thing is I'd like to give you a sneak peek into the, into the leadership and the culture that we have at Simply Mac. I think um, people talk about culture, they talk about you know, you know, employee passion and all these wonderful things. Um, it's something that's critical to the long-term success of a business. Um, and sometimes people will mistake or they'll uh, They'll confuse leadership and culture. Leadership is very different and very specific and very, and very defined. So I want to talk a little bit about leadership. 
You can be a great leader in your own business. You can be a great leader in someone else's business. You can be a great leader as a, um, as a father. Uh, uh, Brooke and I have four children. Um, so you know, my role is uh, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a little league football coach, and I sell computers. And then I try and volunteer in the community and, and do some other things too. So, um, and it balances crazy, but leadership will help you in any category of anything you do. So I think, I think that's a message I'd like to kind of leave with you and just tell you a little bit my views about uh, leadership and culture. So, so Simply Mac, I'll talk just a couple of slides. Uh, Simply Mac was founded in 2006. We currently have uh, 23 retail stores in 10 states. Uh, 14 of those stores were built in five months of last year. Uh, we do sales, service, and training in all of our retail locations. Uh, we have a buy-sell trade program where you can actually trade in your product towards other products. Uh, we have a business sales team. We're authorized uh, by AT&T to sell and service and activate the iPhone. Uh, and as of December of uh, last year, we had about 256 employees. Here's an example of our store in Idaho Falls, and, and this is the Gateway Mall in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is the interior of our stores. Has anybody ever been into a Simply Mac store? Thank you. Has anybody bought anything from a Simply Mac store? Thank you, double. <laughs> so we try, we, are, we try to brand ourselves as an Apple store in markets that Apple doesn't have retail stores. Uh, that's not always the case. Um, Apple has uh, stores in Salt Lake. We have stores in Salt Lake. We have two. Um, but we're in, in cities like Grand Junction, Colorado, uh, Greeley, Colorado. Uh, we're, uh, there's a good friend of mine open, uh, owns a dealership here in Logan. Um, but uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, Springfield, Missouri, Lubbock, Texas, Midland, Texas, Shreveport, Louisiana, Cheyenne, Wyoming, Missoula, Bozeman, Montana, Bend, Oregon, those type of cities. Apple has about 255 company-owned retail stores in the 50 U.S. states. Uh, we believe there are hundreds of underserved markets where you could have an exclusive dealer branded Apple store where Apple will never go because the cities are just too small. So that's our business plan. We wanna be Apple dealer branded in small to medium sized markets. Here's an example of our interior stores. Uh, we were recently acquired by GameStop in uh, uh, November of 2013. We did that for a couple of reasons. One is we felt like there was an immediate opportunity that we could dramatically expand our footprint. We had the internal capital. We've never had any debt. We've uh, bootstrapped this from the very beginning and built our business on company cash flows, 100%. And that's been painful, but it's been very slow. We, we are very conservative when we run our financial statements. Our balance sheet is very conservative. We take risks, but they're very calculated risks. Uh, some investors uh, don't wanna lose investors' money. I don't wanna lose my own money. So we have, we have built stores and built our business in a way that we felt is scalable, profitable, sustainable, uh, and successful. So you can see our store count. Um, we built our second store in 2007. We went to three, five, eight, nine. Um, we got an investment in November of, 23, of uh, 2012 where we built a chunk of stores and then we recently um, sold the remainder of the, of the business to GameStop. GameStop is a Fortune 300 company, about nine billion in sales, um, and they have about 4,200 retail locations in the U.S., about 6,515 companies. Uh, people ask me all the time, why in the world did you do a deal with GameStop? Why, you know, GameStop and Simply Mac, that's, that's very different. Your customers are different. Um, GameStop is the largest consumer technology, specialty retailer in the country with 4,200 stores. They know real estate um, better than anybody else from site selection, lease negotiation, uh, store construction, or repair and maintenance than anybody else. Uh, and then uh, with about you know, their employees that flex up to about 52,000 in the, in the holiday period, they can recruit and train and hire um, as good or better than anybody else. So, uh, and they have, uh, they're one of about 25 Fortune 500 companies that have uh, no debt, and their EBITDA is about five to 600 million per year. So um, very solid, financially stable uh, company. Um, and we're, so our growth trajectory, uh, we're gonna build at least 20 stores this year and up to 50 next year. So um, we're really excited. We believe there are hundreds, again, of markets uh, that could um, have a Simply Mac in them. And 
And there um, we have relatively no competition. There, there, aren't, there isn't another company out there doing what Simply Mac is doing. Uh, we're the largest specialty retailer for Apple in all of North America with 23 stores. Uh, we were the largest at 13 stores when we built our store last, uh, last summer in Lincoln, Nebraska. So if we're the largest at 13, the largest at 23, the advantages of being number one in that market um, or being the largest dealer, there are lots of efficiencies. We get better pricing through our vendors. We, get bet better, um, we have better negotiation rights with our landlords, especially with a partner that has 4,200 other retail stores in the US. So that's our growth plan. Um, here's where our stores are currently. Uh, again, we're in 10 states. Um, next slide. This is where Apple Company and Retail is today. Next slide. This is how we're complementary to what they're doing. So we're taking, you can see, there's about 54 of Apple stores that are in the state of California. There's about 120 stores in these seven states in the Northeast. It's this section right here. And especially, you can see you know, the markets that we're targeting, either that we have signed LOIs on or are negotiating. So um, it's exciting. The world's a big place. The US is a big place. There are lots of people that live in small to medium-sized markets of a couple hundred thousand people that are underserved. And we, we, who are we to deny that customer the right to buy at a Simply Mac store? So, next slide. So let's talk about Apple a little bit. So Apple, you think about Apple in, uh, in Mar on March 26 of 2014, you think, boy, that'd be a great business to invest in. We got in the business right here, August of 2006. So Apple starts, you know, or you look at this timeline, um, Look at the, and you know, there's been phenomenal things that have happened from here. We had the economy, but from here to here, the stock went from two bucks to 700 bucks, and it's down in, the, I think, in the 540 range today. I think it was 541 this morning, when I, 548 this morning. So, next slide. Here's, uh, here's Apple compared to the Dow in the same time period. 1994, Apple's up 7,000%. Dow's up about maybe 400%. Next slide. Here's the period of time from 2005 to 2014. So the last, uh, last nine years, 600% increase, still not a bad increase if you look at um, their stock versus about 50% you know, increase from the Dow. So you're thinking, how in the world did you guys anticipate this? Well, we didn't. So sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes hard work and preparation and good luck equates to a really successful business, and sometimes it doesn't. We were fortunate that we made a, 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 good, a good guess, a good bet. Next slide. When we started Simply Mac in uh, June of 2005 at the Apple Worldwide Developer Conference, Apple made a key announcement. They announced that they were going to start putting Intel processing chips into the Mac computers. Huge shift for them to do that. We founded Simply Mac in August of 2006. They launched the iPhone in June of 2007, MacBook Air in March of 2008, the first iPad in 2010, iPhone 5 in September of 2012. So if you look at, um, now company success is, an all, is not always predicated based on the price of their stock, but it's a pretty good indicator. And anyone who invested in Apple stock and still has their stock for the last 10 years has done really, really well. And those who have bought and sold and, and made the arbitrage have done uh, extremely well too. So we believed in, uh, and again, this is, this is my fourth startup, but in our small group of individuals, we believed that Apple made great products. We believed that they were gonna continue to make great products. Again, we were in the, we were in the business when this, Anybody ever seen one of these or own one of these? This is an iPod Mini. I wrote it on the back. This is the uh, version one, January 2004. So they manufactured these and some white MacBook computers made out of uh, plastic they made, uh, they used uh, on football helmets. And they said, here's, you know, here's our line. We're gonna sell MacBook computers and, uh, and these. Now this was a third generation iPod Classic, uh, April 28, 2003 is when they announced this. Thousand songs in your pocket with Steve Jobs, if you've got, gone back or watched him, he 
pulls this out of his pocket, out of his jeans, and he says, you can hit a thousand songs in your pocket. And hence launched the MP3 industry. And MP3 had been around for a while, and other uh, manufacturers were trying to do successful things about branding, but with the iPod, revolutionized the MP3 business completely. Uh, think about the tablet. Anybody ever seen one of these? This is a Motorola Envoy. This is the first tablet PC that Motorola built in 1994. Uh, didn't sell, I think they sold 50,000 units. Um, uh, Bell South, Mitsubishi, IBM came out with a, a phone called the Simon. It was the first integrated, this is in, also in 1994. Um, it had a SIM chip. The SIM chip looks like this, if you've ever seen a PCMCA card. <laughs> this device, so what does it say right there? One megabyte. One megabyte <laughs> of storage. Isn't that awesome? So why was this not successful? And why is a device like this successful? Is it timing? Is it marketing? Is it brand? Is it distribution? Is it financing? Why, why, why does that happen? Why is this not successful and the tablets that most of us have, or iPads, or maybe they're not, an, maybe it's a different tablet, why is it successful? Lots of different reasons, but. Yeah. Do you think this product or this product had anything to do with the success of the tablet or the MacBook computer or the iPhone? Absolutely. The user interface of these products was revolutionary. It was easy, um, it was scalable, um, and it was, it was just it was different. It was different. Uh, Steve Jobs talked about, you know, think different was his, one of his deals. But anyway, so we, um, I mean, I show you this timeline. Um, there is no way in the world when we started Simply Mac with one store in Orem, Utah in August 2006 that we could have ever predicted what's happened over the last eight years, no way. But we believed that Apple was, gonna, was building and would continue to build great innovative products and there was lack of distribution. At the time, uh, there were about 100 company-owned retail stores uh, and you could buy an Apple computer from an Apple-badged employee inside of a CompUSA. Or you could go to apple.com or you could buy it from a company bookstore, that was it. They weren't in Best Buy, Walmart, Target, Costco. There was no distribution and there was a couple of dealers around the country my background was I had owned a chain of wireless retail stores and then managed a bunch after and thought, wow, what, you know, we were thinking, what is one of the greatest products in the world and what do we believe, what companies do we believe are gonna continue to manufacture great products where there's limited distribution? We had a list of like seven or eight and we kept going back to Apple thinking this is, there's something here, there's something here. These products, they're more expensive, but there's, there's something here. We believe that Apple's onto something. Uh, so we made a bet, built a couple of stores, and 23 stores later, and $80 million of revenue, and we're still just in startup mode, we believe. We still believe there is a ton of upside uh, in our business. So let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about Best Buy. And this is in no way to disparage national retail at all. I managed national retail for T-Mobile for a long time. But here's what's happening inside of national retail today. Uh, Best Buy as we know it, they have a chain of about you know, 800 to 1,000, 20 to 30,000 square foot stores. And they have about six to 800, 2,000 square foot stores and malls they've branded Best Buy Mobile. What can you buy in these stores today? Everything. What's happening inside of Best Buy? Uh, Apple. Apple did something revolutionary where they put kiosks, Apple branded kiosks and fixtures in the back of a Best Buy store and they staffed it with an Apple employee. Um, what happened next? Samsung says, boy, that's a great idea. Let's go do the same thing. Let's put a 40 by 50 foot section right in the middle of the store so when people on their way back to the Apple section, they stop by a Samsung display and talk to a Samsung rep and you can buy a Samsung phone, a Samsung camcorder, a Samsung camera, a Samsung whatever, computer, tablet. Uh, and then what happened just recently? Microsoft says, boy, this is great. We want to get in the game. 
We want to lease 60 to 100 linear square feet on the side of a Best Buy store, and we want to sell Microsoft products exclusively. We've got the Xbox One, we have Microsoft Office, we have Windows, we have all these other great products. We want to display those inside of a national retail location. So Best Buy is essentially Best Buy's problem, or one of their challenges, is that they have these large format stores with two categories that have essentially evaporated, CDs and movies. Um, so they have all this storefront, they have all this real estate that they're paying uh, rent on, and they need to fill it. So why not become a regional mall and sublease that space out to your three best friends, Microsoft, Samsung, and Apple? Solve my rent problem, solve some of my payroll problem. What happens for a consumer? They want to go into, a, I've got to go by the Microsoft section and the Samsung section on my way back to find the Apple section. And for Apple, they're thinking, boy, where Best Buy was a strategy for me in, in small to medium sized markets where I didn't have a company owned retail store. Today, my customer now walks by the Microsoft section, they walk by the Samsung section, they may walk, walk by the Sony section or somebody else uh, down the road before they get to you know, my section. And if the food court smells really good, when you walk into the mall, you never get back to the department store to buy your cleats for your soccer game. You just kind of get distracted. And so that's, that's, those are some of the dynamics. We believe um, in consumer technology, specialty retail. If you want to buy an Apple product, you can buy it from a couple of different places. If there's an Apple store in the market, great. If there's not, uh, and if you have specific questions, you can either buy from vendor A, which has a large suite of services, or you can buy from Simply Mac or another specialty retailer that's exclusively focused on selling that product. We train our people only on Apple products, um, and we, we have a wider selection, and we do buy, sell, trade, we do warranty and non-warranty repair service, we do training, we sell new and used products, and they're all Apple. So that's our pitch. Um, and that's, one of, the, that's the, you know, one of the primary reasons that we aligned with GameStop when we um, were raising money. We could have either gone to a financial investor or a strategic investor, uh, and we felt the synergies with these two companies were phenomenal. So, next slide. So here's, here's one of my favorite parts of the, the, the presentations, company culture. So when we started uh, Simply Mac, um, we took a white sheet of paper, put it up on the wall and decided, what do we want to be when we grow up? What are, if, let's, let's think big and act small. So let's, you know, let's take, um, and I had just recently been about four and a half years at T-Mobile, where we went through a complete rebrand from voice stream to T-Mobile. I was on the culture team where we recultured and kicked off this new brand and this exciting new culture to all the T-Mobile employees. So we came up with the, with the value shield. Uh, and what we call an S factor. So I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is available on our website, but we have five key values. Um, spirit, simplicity, self-discipline, sincere integrity, and solidarity. And those are, those are embraced by this, this shield that we call the S factor. Um, the shield protects, it defends, uh, and, uh, and helps us as we go into battle to save the brand and to create opportunities for our employees and their families. So, and then we have a vision, a mission, a motto, a pledge, um, and these are very real. Uh, we stand up, and uh, this is, a, as Jack Welch would call it, we have a somewhat of a cult-like culture uh, where people, um, we've had some people that have come into our, our industry and our company in a couple of weeks, and they say, you guys, you guys remind me of the Boy Scouts. You guys stand up and say the pledge, and you, and you do all these different things, but our, uh, our pledge that we say every time we meet is very easy. I will take care of our customers or someone else will. I will challenge and empower myself and others every day. I will pre prepare today for tomorrow's opportunities. I am accountable to the business and will be given the tools to succeed. I will work hard, improve myself, and enjoy life. And then everyone screams, I am Simply Mac. So uh, that may be a little weird, um, but we do it every meeting. Uh, come to one of our meetings, and you'll see our guys screaming. Just, it just, it's it's fun. Um, so that's our culture. Um, S factor, what truly is the S factor? Uh, I believe S, S factor is the uh, success. These will go through pretty quick. What's success? I think the three elements you have to have success are for yourself, your customer, and your company. 
next slide. Uh, and some people will think, click three times quick, that the company might be the bedrock, the customer is the engine, and the self is the passion, where the company is the most important and the employee does a little bit of, you know, a little bit of frosting or, or top spin on the ball. Next slide. We flip that completely around. One more slide. Uh, oh, go back one. We believe that the employee or the individual is the most important thing at our business in, in what we do. And everything else hinges on the success of what our employees do. Our frontline employees are the most important people in our company. Um, we provide them the most training. Uh, they have the most interaction with the, with the customer on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and everything else, you know, so we kind of have a you know, big company, little me, but everything focuses on the, on the importance of the, of the individual. So culture and leadership, this is where I talked about this being real specific and really defined. So uh, lead, we call this the leadership pyramid. So there's different ways to lead people. You can manage people, lead them, coach, motivate, and inspire. So if I want to manage someone, it's like, Jimmy, thanks for coming to work today. Um, you know, make sure you come in at eight and leave at five and take a, two hour, take a one hour lunch and have a nice day and check with me when you get your, need your vacation. So I can manage, I can manage you really well and I can, I, can, I can make sure that you're doing what you need to do. Leading somebody, you lead someone. Get out on the floor, Jimmy, let me show you how to do it. This is, uh, let, me, let me tell you if, you, if you interact with a customer this way and you help them understand and, and their, what their true needs are and help them internalize those, you can, you can be a better salesperson. You can sell more stuff if you get to know the customer. So let me lead you and let me tell you how to do this. Coach someone. Tell them how to do that, and then get out and say, here, let me, let me try this one. I'm going to give you whatever commission I get on the sale, but let me show you how to do it. So you go out there and coach and develop. You show, come back and talk to the individual, go out and do it again, do it three or four more times, pair them with different people, and you coach and develop these people until they do you know, great things. Motivate them. Um, how do you motivate someone? Sometimes with compensation. Sometimes understanding what they really need and what they really want um, and, and helping them to get there. Uh, and inspire. So how do you inspire if, if true leaders, who's ever been truly inspired by a leader either at your company or in your community or, you know, and what, you know, what, what inspires people to do great things? What inspires you to run through a brick wall or climb to the top of a mountain at 2 a.m.? Look, one of you guys. Or, any, or, or go ahead. Yeah, um, my boss right now actually um, got me to work for him because he was completely passionate and just so enthusiastic about everything. It made me want to just, you know, jump off a bridge for him. So it's passion, it's leadership, it's direction, it's coaching, it's all these things. And you're going to manage one person. Maybe you have to do a little bit of this pyramid. And maybe, you know, on some employees you're going to flex to one of these other categories or not. But um, if you can spend, next slide, if you can spend the majority of your time truly inspiring your employees, uh, think how much greater it is for you, your business, and for the employee. If you can truly find out how to inspire them and how to, how to passionately motivate them to do things they've never been able to do before, um, we believe that's the, that's the key to leadership. Leadership, I think you look at success, we talk about success and the S factor. Success is setting a clear vision. Having a vision and clearly communicating it, having a thriving culture, hiring fantastic people, and celebrating success along the way. Next slide. So company leadership. Next slide. So I've probably read like 30 books on leadership and been to 15 seminars. Um, what I believe, if I could capsulate what leadership, it is for, what leadership is for me and our business, next slide, it's three things. LDR, I, we love acronyms. We love, we love football analogies at Simply Mac because I, I love little league, coaching Little League football. And we love um, acronyms. So this is one you should write down. A true leader, and this is going to help you in every sense of your lives, whether it's I want to be a better spouse, father, mother, parent, um, grandparent, grandchild, sibling, friend, business person, you know, whatever it is, this applies to everything. So it's leadership, decisions, and results. 
So let's talk about that. LDR. So leadership. Leadership for me is two things. So being able to come up with a strategy and clearly communicate it. And clearly communicating it means that you have to be able to do that verbally and written. You have to be able to spell or know how to use spell checker to be a great leader in most cases. <laughs> Second thing, decisions, short term and long term. And what decisions do we make? Our store managers say, well, what, what decisions do I make? I mean, how, you're talking about LDR and how to be, be a leader and what decisions can I make? Single most important that a man, decision that a manager makes is what? Hiring, who to hire? Who to hire and who to fire? Um, and we say, and I think that the successful business owners will tell you, um, quick to fire, slow to hire. Take your time and do it right, and when you know it's not working, make a move. So quick to fire, slow to hire. Um, so decisions, uh, and then next, uh, next two, yeah, one more. And then can I make, can I get financial and strategic results? So LDR, think about this as a student. Think about it in your workplace. Um, can you lead? Can you get results? Uh, can you lead? Can you make decisions? Can, and can you get results? If you can do those three things, you will be successful. You will absolutely be successful. This is a recipe for success. Um, now, there are things that are going to come and go, and there'll be short-term losses and things that will happen along the way. If you can do this and sustain this long-term, you will be successful. If you, can, if you can articulate a strategy and communicate it, if you can make good decisions, and if you can get results, you'll be successful. So we have, uh, we have three acronyms for this year. LDR, which I've talked about, GOAL, and GSD. So GOAL, if you're a soccer player and you, you kick a goal, you're winning. Um, but GOAL for us, for Simply Mac, for this year, um, who, who, inspires, who inspires the leader? If, if we tell all of our employees that they're individual leaders of their own respective business units, um, they'll, they'll say, well, how do, I, how do I get my own inspiration? How do I, and I'm waiting for somebody else to tell me the secret sauce. I'm waiting for someone else to tell me the greatest book that I should read or how I should implement this. Um, so next slide. So leadership, LDR, goal is get out and lead. And GSD is get stuff done. So those are the three things that we have at Simply Mac this, this year. So goal, so get out and lead. You gotta figure out a way to inspire yourself. Who inspires the leader? Who motivates the leader? And when the chips are down, you gotta figure out a way to get it done yourself. Don't rely on someone else to teach, train, or carry you to the finish line. Figure out a way to get up and get it done. It doesn't matter what level in the organization you are. Um, you can absolutely, you can absolutely do it, but, but a part of that has to come from within. You have to be able to inspire yourself to be able to help inspire others. So don't wait for someone else to teach you or train you. Um, most of it, a lot of it, will come from you, um, and you can, you can do it. Next slide. Key partnerships, we've got a couple of key partnerships. Next slide. We're fortunate to work with two of the top brands in the world, um, as recorded by Forbes in, in uh, typo in 2013. Um, <laughs> so Apple's brand has been uh, estimated about $1.4 billion, and AT&T's brand about $24 billion. Next slide. You look at the top 15 brands in the world today. Apple, Microsoft, Coke, IBM, Google, McDonald's, GE, Intel, Samsung, Louis Vuitton, BMW, Cisco, Oracle, Toyota, and AT&T. We're fortunate to work all, all day, every day, with six of the top 15 brands. Apple and Microsoft, we sell lots and lots of Microsoft software for Mac. GE, all of our consumer financing is done through a company called GE Capital, GE Money. Um, so we sell, we, we do 12 and 18 months interest-free financing all the time through GE. Intel, we represent Intel because it's part of Apple. Uh, Cisco, we sell a lot of Meraki and a lot of other networking products that's uh, sold by Cisco. And AT&T, we're a, we're a national dealer for AT&T. So uh, it's, you know, it's fortunate when you can work with one of these companies. We feel blessed to be able to work with six every single day. Um, and it's fun. Small little company based in Utah, largest dealer for Apple in, in North America. Um, who would have thought? Why Utah? Why Salt Lake City? Why Simply Mac? Um, 
Next slide. I think that's uh, I think that's kind of it. So um, maybe I'd just open it up for questions. We've got about 15 minutes or so, and yeah. I noticed that soon after you guys sell their products, Apple had a big um, growth. How big of an impact do you think you guys had on that growth, and what did you guys do to help them grow? Yeah, so Apple, that's a great question. Um, we sell lots and lots of Apple products. We sell, we are a rounding error for Apple. Apple is a, uh, they're a, a multi-billion dollar company. Um, we are a large piece in our minds for them. We are a small piece. iPhone for Apple is about 59% of their total global revenue. Uh, they've signed, I think they're in 130 countries. They just signed uh, China Mobile. Um, they were with Singular for a while in the US, which became AT&T, and then they signed with Verizon, and then with Sprint, and then with T-Mobile. Um, Apple's success was fueled primarily by the, um, the iPhone and the tablet in the last several so years. It's products that were affordable, and they created new product segments. So the tablet category existed. I mean, you know, there's, you know, Products like this, these were, these were right on tablets. There was a stylus that popped out, and you wrote on this. There was no keyboard. Um, uh, there were smartphones. Smartphones been around for 20 years, 20th anniversary of the Simon. Um, IBM and Mitsubishi's project that was marketed exclusively by Bell South. Uh, there are companies like Nokia that built the, Nokia commu the pocket communicator. That was a smartphone in 1999. Um, but Apple just, um, Apple created a supply and demand curve that we've never seen before. Um, the way that they marketed their product and the way that they controlled supply and demand has been amazing. It's been amazing. We've been fortunate to, to be a really strong partner and sell a bunch of their stuff along the way. But good question. So Apple is notoriously difficult to partner with. Uh, can you maybe explain a little bit of the process of how you went about uh, gaining some traction and partnering with Apple and how you got that deal? Yeah. Happen? So there is absolutely a perception that Apple is a difficult partner. No question about it. Um, people that do business with Apple um, um, may tell you that or may not. People that haven't been able to strike a business deal with Apple will certainly tell you that they're very difficult. Um, Apple is just like any other company. They're, uh, they're a collection of really smart men and women that are working towards a common goal and trying to kind of change, um, simplify technology and, and change the way that we live. Um, I think the key to any successful business partnership is um, gaining trust, proving yourself, getting results, communicating those results, working strategically together in a partnership, and, uh, and taking it one step at a time. We, um, there have been many companies since we've started that have tried to replicate what we're doing and have been unsuccessful. Uh, I think some of that is uh, timing. Uh, and I think some of it is that we, we just do what we say we're going to do. If we say we're going to do something, we do it. And, uh, and, and there's just no games. It's just here, here's what we're we, we going to go do, and here's what we did. And here's what we're going to go do next year, and here's what we did. And, and so it's... Whether or not you're Apple or another large or small company, if you, can, if you can get results, back to the LDR, if you can get results and make great decisions and partner together, you can do it. You can do it with any brand in the world. Um, just, yeah, you have, to, you have to be able to deliver on what you commit to. Uh, and so, so I would say today, um, uh, we work with Apple a lot. I'll be in Cupertino next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and we, I'm there a lot, and we talk, um, we talk about building our business. We talk about opportunities in the marketplace. We talk about you know, how, to, how to leverage products and relationships to do great things. So um, don't be, for those of you who are thinking about starting a business and you think it either can't be done or it's never been done or it's too hard or it's, you know, the part of the, just, just keep trying. It took me... Um, I think I called Apple about eight or nine times before I got the first return call. And we, we just were persistent. And we believed that we had a message to tell them. And, uh, and again, they're like, 
great, Steve, that's awesome. Pat, pat you on the head. It's really great. You know, I love your idea. We want to be the largest distributor of Apple products in North America in five years. Okay. Go have a peanut butter sandwich. It's going to be okay. It's going to be great. But and then we did it. We were the we were the um, we were the tenth largest distributor in our first year of business for Apple. Number ten in the specialist channel because we we um, and we kept asking them, "Who's number one? Who's number one?" They said, "What do you guys want to know?" I said, "Because we want to be there someday." They're like, "Okay, great. That's good. You know, good for you. That's awesome." And and so we'd report back. I'd uh, I'd send an email um, at the end of every quarter. Um, Here's where we are, here's where we are, here's where we're gunning for. We're number six, we're number five, we're number four, we're number three, number two, number one. And then we woke up one day and we'd, you know, we'd sold $100 million of Apple products in a, sh a, for a sh uh, short few years. And they thought, really? Really? And uh, sure enough. So it's just be persistent. Believe in yourself. Don't take no for an answer. Just, you know, gotta, just persistence. Just, if you believe in something passionately enough, it makes sense. You gotta, you gotta get the meeting. First you gotta get the meeting, and then you gotta deliver the results. So, a great question. Uh, it kinda goes along with that, but since you're a retailer of these really big companies, they probably expected a good portion of your sales, right? So did you, was that ever an obstacle for you where they were trying to take advantage of like, taking a large part of, part of your sales, and what did you do that? That's a great question. So you can see how we branded our company, Simply Mac. We made a conscious choice that we wanted to be an exclusive distributor for Apple in markets that we do business. So we're not simply computers. We're not simply Google. We're not simply laptop. We're not simply desktop. We're simply Mac. So we decided up front the way that we're going to, and, and having managed a lot, having been a dealer, a wire, I was a wireless dealer for about eight years, owned my own chain of stores. Then I managed a bunch of wireless dealers. Then I managed all of national retail. Uh, for T-Mobile, when we went to Apple, I, you know, I believe in consumer technology, especially retail. And to get there, we felt like with Apple, we're going to have more success if we step more into this category of exclusivity. I said, guys, I'm willing to be totally exclusive. I want to build a store. I want to brand it with my name and your name. I want to hire employees. I'll sign the lease. I'll pay for the employees. I'll buy the product. I want to wake up all day every day and sell your stuff. Will you give me a chance? Well, okay. That, that sounds like a pretty good deal for me. You take all the risk. I get all the upside. You represent our brand, which we're not really comfortable with many people representing our brand or using our marks. But okay, let's roll the dice. And we did it. We chose to be exclusive. We believe it's paid off for us in the long term. Um, now, what happens if Apple stops making great products? We've signed a bunch of long-term leases in malls and strip centers across the country. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem for us. It's a really big problem for Apple if they stop making and distributing great products. We believe that Apple's gonna be a long-term, you know, strong player in consumer technology products and services. So that's, that's our bet, that's our risk. Their risk is entrusting us with their brand and their customers and their marks. So we execute on that and work on that every day. So I do, and I stand up in a meeting and say, guys, I want to, uh, next year, I want to do, I want to work harder to sell more of your stuff, exclusively. I'm not selling Samsung, I'm not selling Toshiba, I'm not selling Sony products, I'm not selling IBM, Dell, anybody else. I want to sell, I want to sell more and more and more of your stuff and, and delight more and more and more of our customers. Uh, and they, you know, they embrace that, and they say, "Okay, let's, you know, let's do it." Uh, kind of a two-part question. Number one, what is your exit? What is your exit strategy? And if you do have one, how did you like develop it? How did you start your company with that in mind? So um, I'm kind of of a build to grow mentality, not build to sell. So of all the companies that I've started, I've never, um, I've never built or grown a company on what an exit strategy is. Uh, we, as I, as I said, we recently sold Simply Mac to GameStop in November of 2013. Um, that exit strategy, I, I don't look at it as an exit strategy. I look at kind of as, you know, you're walking through a maze of 100 doors in a building and it was like door three. Uh, we're, rewriting, we're rewriting history, we believe, for consumer technology, especially retail. And I tell our guys all the time, if we're writing a novel with 30 chapters, 
We're like in chapter three. So, you know, chapter three was Simply Mac gains access to capital to be able to execute on a distribution strategy that nobody else has the capital or expertise to do. So, um, if you build a company to sell it, I believe you're going to make short term mistakes. I think you'll cheat your shell, yourselves, you'll cheat your customers, you'll cheat your employees. So, well, I think in the, you know, the back of my mind, I, I, I thought that, you know, maybe we'd sell it someday, but um, I, I, um, yeah, just as a general point, I'm, I'm a build to grow guy and not a build to sell guy. So I, and I think you better make, you, you make better long-term decisions if you have that mindset. But good, great question. Anybody else? Yeah? Do you see in the future Apple coming out with another new product line that is as revolutionary as I I sure hope so. Because <laughs> we'll sell a ton of them. <laughs> I believe they will. I believe that Apple has... Um, I mean, who, um, there's a couple of companies that are very innovative right now. Uh, I believe Apple is one and will continue to be one long term. And we'd like to be in more markets and sell more of their stuff exclusively. We'd, we'd like to, and again, we sell service and train on all this stuff. There's an opportunity for customers to come back in our stores frequently. Got to buy an accessory, got to get my Mac fixed, got a new iPhone, I got to, I got to activate my iPhone and bundle it on mobile share got family data share plan. So there's so much convergence. I mean, think about, you know, think about these devices. Um, I mean, this device revolutionary, revolutionized the industry. Um, this device here, uh, I mean, I was, selling, I was selling flip phones for 600 bucks when I started. Uh, and then you had a flip phone and a pager. And then there was you had digital phones where you could digitally text. And then uh, who's ever heard of T9 texting before? So you used to be able to tap out on your computer before you had a, you know, a, a screen you could tap out, you know, these, you'd text your friends on T9. And, and now you have a device that this device is 100 times more powerful than the, the computer that I had in college. It does all my email, takes you know, eight megapixel camera uh, photos, uh, does video recording, has slow motion mode, um, stores a gazillion photos, and I can watch movies on this thing. I can do everything on this device this didn't even exist. It didn't even exist six years ago. Um, do I believe there's, there's going to be products over the next three to four years that didn't even exist today? Absolutely. Technology is changing so fast, we just want to sell it to people. We just want to, we want to be in markets and close to customers where they're going to say, boy, I don't really know if an integrated watch or sunglasses. So Ray-Ban just came out. Uh, Somebody announced with Ray-Ban this morning for uh, Google. I think Google and Ray-Ban announced this morning that they had a you know a new they have Ray-Ban glasses um, for Google. They're fifteen hundred bucks. Um, now those are probably those are probably drop to eight hundred to three hundred to two hundred. Um, and the guys that are going to sell those are going to make a lot of money. And they um, we'd like to be the con the preferred consumer technology retail channel for companies like Apple. Take it closer to the customer in your community give you an opportunity to come in in an assisted sale environment and transact business. You give us money, we give you a great property, product, and everybody's happy. And then come back and do it again, and come back and do it again. So I do. I do believe that Apple will continue to innovate. I don't know what the next one is, but I hope there's a lot of margin in it. I hope we can get a lot of allocation. I hope we can sell a lot. Yes? Um, I think that happens. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Best Buy has been National Retail has been accused of being or or been associated with being a showroom for the online retailers for sure. Um, uh, uh, you can find price, you know, products cheaper online sometimes. Um, and I think I think I think customers are becoming very savvy. Technology has enabled customers to get really really smart. I remember when I, when I um, bought a car, my first car that I'd actually done research on the internet, and I'd printed out the cost, the invoice, went into the dealer, and, and he's like, where'd you get this stuff, man? Where'd, where'd you get this stuff? And I saw well, this website and did this, and I think this is what your invoice is. And he says, that's, that's exactly my cost. And uh, so he said, this is going to change the way that we all do business. And it has. 
Who researches online before they buy a product in the store? I certainly do. I absolutely do. Um, and think about for us, um, you know, we, we, tell our, you know, we tell our customers um, this all the time. Uh, a computer is typically the third most expensive purchase you're going to make. You're going to buy a house, you're going to buy a car, you're going to buy a computer. What other, what other products are you going to buy outside of a college education? What else are you going to buy for 2000 bucks? It doesn't, I mean, you're gonna, maybe, maybe you buy a boat or an RV or a motorcycle, but for the average consumer, it's an important purchase. Darn right, I'm going to do research and I want to buy it from a trusted source. If I'm going to, if I'm going to give you two thousand dollars for something that I use, um, how much time do you guys spend on your cell phones? More than an hour a day. My kids spend hours on these things. Um, how much time do you spend on your computer? More than you spend in your house, probably, right? Uh, more than you spend in your car. So it's a device you want to feel trusted. You want to be able to use, you want to be able to know that when you're spending money with a, with a company, they're going to be there. And, but we do. To your point, there's, um, customers become very, very savvy, very smart. And we have to adapt. And, and if we can offer them services um, and provide an experience that's better than saving 20 bucks by having it show up your door, that's where we win. We are, our sales reps are pretty savvy. Yep, they're pretty savvy. One last question. So, I mean, obviously Apple's a massive company. So my question is just that in negotiating with such a large company, what were some of the road bumps that you found? If, or were there any major road bumps? Yeah, so great question. So um, one of the challenges that we've had since the very beginning is access to cash and um, supply allocation. So if Apple only, and I, I told this, I, I said this kind of early in my presentation, one of the things that Apple's done extremely well is they've controlled the supply demand curve better than almost anybody. So if a hot product comes out, there's always going to be limited supply of Apple products, right? You ought to you get them early or you got to wait. And, and so the challenges that we've had are having access to cash and then getting enough supply. You know, even, you know, even to this day, there is not enough supply to meet the demand when a new Apple product comes out, whether it's iPhone 6 or iPad 5 or, you know, even the iPad 1. When the iPad 1 came out, we had... We had Reasonable supply, but we could have sold 10 times as many iPads if we had the stock. So I think that's part, I mean, that's part, of, the, part of the brilliance of a marketing company, especially a manufacturing company that is so well versed in marketing and, and economics. So, but that's, I mean, there's, there's lots of um, you know, small challenges. That's probably the biggest one for us. It's just a company of their size and a company of our size and in growth. I mean, it's very hard. We grew, we grew by 100% three years in a row, and we're going to do it again for the next couple of years. And it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's a lot of work. Um, you gotta, there's, there's two speeds to a startup, an entrepreneurial, start, entrepreneurial startup. Fast and faster. So you think about the, the pace of play, the rate of speed that you have to be able to transact and hire and change to meet demands as a startup, it's, it's crazy. But it, um, if you love to do something that's never been done, that's a huge challenge, you like to walk, walk around with your hair on fire all the time, start your own business. There's, uh, I, I tell our guys, there's, um, there's three kinds of people in life. There's people that make things happen. There are people that watch things happen. And then there's people that wonder what happened. Uh, make sure you're in the first category if you're going to start your own business, because you have to make things happen. You have to GSD. You have to get stuff done every single day. There's no, there's no downtime in a, in a startup. But yeah, my last plug, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to start a business, educate yourself. Get in an industry that you understand. Um, surround yourself with really, really smart people. And, and take a shot. Do it. Limit your risk, but, but take a shot. You'll learn more about you and those around you than any other you know, experience you'll go through. And it's exhilarating. It's so much fun. 
It's way more work than you ever thought it was going to be. It's going to cost you more money than you'd ever planned, but you'll learn a ton and it's a lot of fun. So thank you. Thank you.